The future. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed lunch. How was it? I'd like to you guys to invite and welcome on stage uh, 2015 World Champion of Public Speaking, 2020 Educational Oscar nominee, five times TEDx speaker. Mr. Muhammad Kahtani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you all hear me? Now I know it's after lunch. Some of you want to sleep. So let's energize you a little bit. Anybody here who was born in January? February or March. Please stand up. If you're born in January, February or March, please stand up. Now, I want you to put your hands like this. A little bit lower. Fantastic. Anybody born in March, April, or May, please stand up. Now for those people, I want you to put your hands like this. Great. Anybody born July, August, or September, please stand up. Please stand up. And anybody who's still sitting, something is wrong. For those people, I want you to put your hand like this. Now, everybody stand up. Nobody is seated, right? Okay, stay like this. Now, when I post this picture, I can say that you all gave me a standing ovation. So thank you for that. Please have a seat. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What is your first memory? What is the first thing that you remember? Now, some of you might remember something when you were three year old or four year old. My first memory, I was seven years old, first grade. I'm sitting at the front of the class. And a teacher walks in and he put the Quran in front of me and asked me to read. And when I started reading, I stuttered. And he slapped my face. Back at Read again. And he slapped me again. What is wrong with you, boy? Read again. And with tears rolling down my face, I tried again and still. And he said, stop, 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 stop. There is no hope out of me. At that moment, I realized I have a problem. I have a speech impediment. I cannot speak well. I have a stuttering problem. And ladies and gentlemen, when you have a problem in your life, whether it's at work or in your personal life, when you come to a crossroad, there is always the easy option and the difficult option. The first lesson I want to teach you today, ladies and gentlemen, is Never take the easy way. The hard way might be difficult and scary, but the easy way is never the way to go. I had 
two options. Either I can face this problem, try to overcome it, try to find a remedy to solve my speech impediment, or I can take the easy way. Keep my mouth shut, never speak to anybody, and I'll be okay. The biggest mistake I did in my life, as a gentleman, is I took the easy way. I took my bag and my stuff, and I sat in the back of the class. When I went home that day, I told my dad about it, and I asked him to tell the teacher not to ask me to participate in class. And he did. I'm from first grade all the way to the last year of high school. That was my life. Do you have childhood friends? I never did. Because every morning I go to school, I sit in the back, and when I come home, I don't even speak to my brothers and sisters. I lock myself in my room. Why? Because I took the easy way. If I spoke, people might laugh at me. Or I might be smacked. Or yelled at. So why take the easy way? Last year of high school, one day I was leaving school. And someone tapped my shoulder. And I looked, it was one of the other students in the class. And he said to me, Muhammad, I don't think I ever heard you speak. And I took a note and a pen, and I wrote, I can't speak. He said, of course you can speak. Because if you couldn't, you would be in special school, but you're with us. That means you can't speak. The problem is that you're afraid. If you want, I can help you. He said, in order to overcome any fear, you need to face the ultimate form of that fear. He said, what do you mean? He said, tomorrow morning, stand in front of the entire school and read the Dalai Ladies and gentlemen, when you are desperate and somebody hands you a helping hand, somebody throws you a helping line, even if the idea doesn't make sense, because you're desperate, you'll hang on to it. So I listened to his advice. The next morning, I stood in front of 400 students. And in my mind, as soon as they opened my mouth, my problem will go away. Because he told me so. And I started speaking. And I started again. And I still remember to this day, 400 students laughing out loud at me. I felt so ashamed, so insignificant. The one thing that I've been avoiding my entire life, I voluntarily walked right into the bar. Because somebody gave me advice. During recess, I went to him. And I said, Allah, like a You told me if I stood and spoke, my problem would go away. Now you saw everybody laughing at me. Are you happy now? Are you happy, you sick, sick freak? Is that what you want to see? You wanted to see everybody laughing at me? And he said, Muhammad, nobody ever makes it from the first time. And this is a lesson to all of you, young people here. You're gonna face difficulties in your life. There will be times when you'll be down on your knees crying, thinking why I couldn't make it, or why I didn't fail. Remember, ask any successful person here, ask every manager and GM in this company, ask them, and they will tell you they never made it from the first time. The happy moments when they felt unworthy. The happy moments when they felt they could never make it. But every time you fall, when you get up again, you're not going to repeat the same mistakes. You'll always make new mistakes, that's fine. But you'll never make the same mistakes again. He said to me, go back and try again. I'm like an idiot, I listened to him again. So the next morning, I stood up. I spoke. 
I started everybody left. The morning after, I stood up, I spoke, I started everybody left. The morning after, I stood up, I started everybody left. And I noticed some of the words that I used to start on yesterday, I don't start on anymore. Oh my God, this is working. He was right. That was my first exposure, my first love for speaking, for standing in front of an audience. It's not for the pain, it's because I had a problem and this is the remedy for it. I finished high school and I studied college in the United States. Every morning, I go to school, every night, I go to comedy clubs and I do standard nights. I figured, listen, they're going to laugh anyways. <laughs> they might as well laugh with me and not laugh at me. During the four years, my stuttering was gone. Alhamdulillah, I was cute. Graduated college, came back, got a job. And just like anybody who started a new job, my focus was I need to prove myself to this job. I need to put my soul and my heart into it. So the, I mean, for the first four years, I've never done any speaking anymore. I thought to myself, eh, speaking, eh, I'll come back to it later. But now, I need to do this. And during the four years, I was working on a project. And at the end, I need to present this project to the company's CEO and board. Present it. It's a piece of cake. I've done speaking all four years in college. I got this. Prepared my presentation, I stood up, I started speaking, and I'm stuttering again. And my boss even stopped me and said, it's okay, I'll take over. Why did the problem come back again? Because then, gentlemen, any talent that you have, if you don't practice it, you will lose it. Some of you might be good at growing, some of you might be good at sports, some of you might be good at socializing. Everybody here is born with a talent. God gave you a talent that nobody else in this entire universe has. Every one of us has a talent. But don't think because you have it, it's always going to be there. What you don't practice, you will always lose. I lost my talent. And I felt speaking is really important in my job. I need to get it back. So I looked around and I find public speaking clubs, they call it Toastmaster clubs. And I joined one of them. And I started to speak again and things got back on track and, you know, my suffering is now in control. Mm -hmm. and then while I'm in this club, the president of the club told me that there's something called the speech contest. And I asked him what it is. He said, well, you compete, you like you write a speech and you compete against people in your own club. If you win, you compete around the like, the area that you're in, you know, like Riyadh or Wuhan or whatever. If you win, you compete in the region that you're in, and then if you win, you compete in the kingdom level, and if you win, you get to represent Saudi Arabia in the international stage. I said, oh, that, that's a long way, but uh, hmm? let, me, let me give it a shot. In 2010, it was my first attempt at competition. I worked on the next level, I qualified to the next level, and when I got to the next level, I got second place. I lost. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm kind of a kind of a sore loser. I don't handle losing very well. I was sitting in the back of the hall and they handed me a, a second place trophy. It's like, it's like a really tiny trophy. I'm looking at it. <laughs> And the president of the club came to me and he said, Muhammad, you did well. Everybody loved this speech. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? I got second place. Hmm? So, dude, get second place. Look at this. Look how tiny this thing is. I can't put this on my desk. It's embarrassing. And he says something to me that stuck in my mind. He said, Muhammad, if women in our line of work, in our lives, 
We might be chasing after not no. We might be chasing yes, yes, after yes, yes. a high paid job. We might be chasing after a lot of things, materialistic things. But it shouldn't be your target. It should be just the team. It will allow you to change not just your life, but the life of everybody around you. He asked me, he said, Hamid, why? Why do you even want to do this competition thing? He said, I thought about the kid. He said, no. Because if it is, it wouldn't bother you that you lost. Which means you want something bigger. What is your target? He said, I don't know. He said, no, what is your target? Ladies and gentlemen, you should have a clear target in your life. In your business in your business level or, or even in your personal level. I once spoke at a college graduation in London. And while I'm speaking, I asked the audience, I said, where do you see yourself in five years or ten years? And somebody stood up and he said, uh, I want to be a successful engineer. All right, thank you. What about you? I want to be a successful engineer. All right, thank you. What about you, man? I want to be a successful engineer. And everybody in this room is let me ask you this question. How do you know that you became a successful engineer? When is that day when you wake up in the morning and say, Yup, today I'm a successful engineer? It doesn't happen. Why? Because you don't have a specific target. A few years ago, in my department, the manager was meeting with the new employees. And he asked them what they want from this company or what they want out of their work. And people started to give him the uh, cliche answer, you know, like, I want to work in an environment that enriches self-development and empowers the team building. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Until one young man stood up, looked at the manager and he said, in 10 years or 15 years from now, I want your job. The manager of said, now that is a person who has a specific goal that he's after. How many of you here can look at your manager and say, in the future, I want your job? For me, that's what success is. If I can get your job, maybe you retire or move on, but I get to get your job, for me, that's what success is. So you have to ask me, Muhammad, what is your target? And I thought about it for a minute and then I said, you know what? I want someday to speak to an audience of a thousand people. If I can stand on stage speaking in front of a thousand people, for me, that would success is. And he said, that's really what you're after. One day, I don't know when, but one day, you'll make it all the way to the World Championship. And you will speak in front of thousands. And then he gave me a piece of paper and a pen. And he said, write your acceptance speech. He said, write acceptance speech. He said, the speech that you're going to say when you win the World Championship. <laughs> you crazy. He said, no. Write it. Because if you write it, you believe it. And if you believe it, God will make it happen. My fellow audience, sometimes in life we say, you know what, I'm just going to try. When you say I'm going to try, you're giving yourself an excuse. An excuse to give up when things start to get a bit hard or a bit more difficult. Instead, say, inshallah, I'll get there. And notice what happens. Rabbi Rahisa Khilat Ibadah. It might take years, but you could get there. Just because you believe. In 2013 or 14, I wanted to compete again. But I thought to myself, I need to write like a really powerful speech. So I sat down and I squeezed my head and, and I wrote the best thing I have ever written in my entire life. I swear, like as soon as I finished writing, I was like, oh my God, this is, oh, this is great. This is, this is just amazing. This was my masterpiece.
the best thing I could do. And when the competition time came, I started competing and, and I qualified, and then on the third round, I lost the game. And I got second place. And I was crushed. Not crushed because I lost. I was crushed because this is my best work. And even my best work is still not good enough. Have you ever felt that way before? Your best work is still not good enough. And you wonder, then, then what am I doing? Am I in the wrong place? Am I, am I wasting my time? If my best work is still not good enough, then I clearly am wasting my time. And one of the other club members came to me congratulating me on my speech and said, Dude, this was my best work and still not good enough. I, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. And he said to me, Hamlet, if you think you already hit your best, then you will stop trying and stop living. Because you already gave yourself a ceiling. You already told yourself that what I'm good for. Not what I'm good Then he said to me, remember him, always remind yourself that your best is yet to come. And I want you all to do this to do the same. If you do something fantastic, don't say, well, I'm so proud of myself. No. Say, you know what? This is even it's not even my best. I can do better. I don't know when, but I can do better. Don't put a limit to yourself ever. If you will not believe what you are capable of. I know a lot of people might think, oh, I'm just a simple me. No, you are a superhero. You can do way more than you, put, than you think that you can. In 2015, I started competing again. And I made it all the way to the kingdom's level. And I got second place. And I was happy with myself, you know. I did well. The second best speaker in the kingdom. No, no, not to share you. The finals that year was supposed to take place in Las Vegas, United States. Two weeks before the finals, I received a phone call. Picked up. Hello. Muhammad Kefal. Muhammad. My dear friend Abdullah Abdullah Dreyf. He's from Riyadh. He's the one who won the Saudi Arabian Championship. And he asked me, he said, do you have a visa to the United States? I said, yeah, why? He said, well, uh, uh, my dad is a bit sick. Uh -huh. And uh, since I'm the oldest child, I kind of feel like I need to be by his side. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'm going to withdraw my name. Since you're second place, you're going to go instead. Second place in Saudi Arabia would compete against the winners from every country in the world. I have no chance. I'm not even ready, I only have two weeks. And the right thing. Good chance, sure, but I'm not ready. And I said to him, can you give me some time to think about it? He said, well, we need to give them an answer in 24 hours. I said, okay, I'll call you tomorrow and then let you know my answer. It happens that in the same day was the meeting of my club. So I'm attending the meeting and I'm sitting in the back. I'm not even paying attention to them because I'm thinking about the phone. And then the meeting, the president of the club, her name is Patrick Singh, she came to me. And she's like, Hamad, are you okay? You see, you see my place. And I told her about the phone call and that he's going to drop out and now they want me to go. I'm not going to go there and make a fool of myself. I thought I should get me. I think I'm gonna drop too. She said something to me, I'll never forget. She said, Hamad, in everybody's life, some chances will come to the most. And that's gonna happen to everybody here. Some chances will come in your life only once. And if you let it slip through your fingers, that chance may not come back again. And when such a chance comes, ladies and gentlemen, you might think, I'm not ready. I'm not qualified. I don't have the talent to do this. But guess what? 
say yes. Figure out a way to do it later, but say yes. Never let that chance slip away from you. She told Muhammad to say yes. I said, Martin, I'm not ready. He said, yeah, yeah, say yes. I didn't write him, say yes. We'll help you. So I said yes. And for two weeks, I'm writing and revising and practicing and whatever. And the time comes and I fly to Las Vegas. 100 contestants from all over the world. They do a draw and they put every 10 speakers in a group. And I gave my speech to my group and I won. And I qualified to finals. The best 10 speakers in the world. And I'm one of them. And you know, when you get so close to that trophy, to that piece of glass, sometimes you forget your target. Sometimes you forget your true aim because it's what I have. I can smell it. I can taste it. It's so close. The time comes. The best 10 speakers, the finalists, they put us in a room behind the stage. And we're sitting in this round table, everybody wishing, oh, I wish you good luck. And in that room, there was a big, giant TV where you get to see whoever is on stage. They did a draw to determine who's going to speak first and who's going to speak, speak last. I was the last speaker, which is good and bad at the same time. Good because you know, you're going to be the finale. Bad is you get to see everybody who speaks before you. And if they're really good, they might, you know, start to mess with your head. The first speaker took the stage. And I'm watching him with that big giant TV thinking, oh, my God. This guy is amazing. Every movement is calculated, his voice is. His mannerism, the message that he owned the stage. And I'm thinking, okay. Maybe I'll win second, please. <laughs> the second guy comes in. And he does even better. Okay. Maybe I'll get to this. And every speaker that day who came on the stage did phenomenal. They did so well. To the point that I sat in the back of the room thinking, yeah, I've made There is no way of doing this. So let's back up a little bit and think why I'm here. You have a message that you believe in. You have an audience waiting. Speak from the heart. Give it to them. Believe. There's no way you're going to win the story. But just, just enjoy the moment. My time comes. Last speaker, I get my up, I walk to the back of the stage, there's a lady standing there to open the curtain, I asked her if I look good, she said no. <laughs> and then I asked her, anyway, uh, how many people out there? She said, 3,500 people. Five years prior, I wanted to speak to a thousand. Now I have three times as much. How many of you here have seen the video of my speech? If you haven't, go back and watch it again. And see what happens right when I walk on stage. I walk on that stage. The light hits me. I saw everybody. And I smiled. Because at that moment I realized my dream came true. I win or lose, I really don't care. I wanted to speak to a thousand, but now I'm speaking to three times as much. My dream came true. I spoke that day, I gave it all I got. I loved the audience, others loved me, they clapped. I stepped down, still thinking there was no way I'm winning this. And I sat in the front row. And they start announcing the winners. Third place, second place, and all the other speakers are going, <sighs> Except me. I'm playing Candy Crush on my phone. <laughs> because I'm not going to win this, right? Third. 
place, second place, and now the world champion of public speaking. How many times? To be honest, I didn't even hear the guy because I was busy playing. The guy behind me punched me in my back. Hello, who? Where? It's you, huh? <laughs> and I walked to that stage like a crazy person. And they handed me that giant trophy, that giant piece of glass. And they said, would you like to say a few words? And as I was walking to that podium, I remember the young child who couldn't speak. I remember the boy who avoided everybody just because he doesn't want to be laughed at or hit, humiliated. And I was wondering, how could this happen? How could this young boy become the best speaker in the world? I stood in that podium and I said, if you asked anybody who knew me when I was young, that one day I'll be here, they would say, impossible. And yet here I am. Not bragging, I'm just saying, the impossible does not exist. Ladies and gentlemen, impossible does not exist. I swear to God, if people do not exist. Hard, yes. Impossible, no way. You are capable of way more than you put your mind into. So I said, let that be a reminder to all of you. Those dreams and goals that you gave up on just because somebody told you you cannot do it. Tell yourself, if this guy can win this trophy, then you probably can do anything. I finished, went to the back of the stage, and as soon as I got to the back of the stage, there was five TV channels and news reporters just waiting for me. Cameras back. Cameras on my face. Imagine like overnight you turn from a nobody to something the whole world knows. And everybody's asking me, uh, how do you feel? I just asked by the voice. Uh, uh, I just asked, I just really need that. And they asked me the same question over and over again. Uh, just like a funny, what's next? I don't know. But seriously, I don't know. I never thought or imagined that I'm going to do this, and yet, I don't know what's next. What is my next move? I have no idea. Then they walked me into a hall, like a big giant hall like this. And there was a table with a stack of papers in front of it. And in front of me, the 3,000 people that watched me speak, they all came lining up just to take a picture of me or have me sign an order. Oh, but God, I'm in the process. And I started signing and taking selfies. You know. <laughs> Thank you, please, yeah, come here, please. And I forgot my true mission. I forgot why I'm here. I was swept by the faith and the attention of people. And that happens. Sometimes when you're famous, you get swept. You forget your true purpose. What is your true purpose? When I'm standing in that line for an hour, people coming up to me and say, a lady came to me. She's in her 40s or 50s. And she had tears in her eyes. And she came to me. She grabbed my hand. She said, son, I don't want to follow you. I don't want to follow you. I stood in this line for an hour just to tell you this. What you said up there will make me a better person. I'll be a better person just because of something that you said. I just wanted to come here and say thank you.
And I know this might be hard to believe, but at that moment, the money meant nothing. The fame meant nothing. The title meant nothing. All of it meant nothing. Because right now, I know what is next to me. Ladies and gentlemen, my true aim now is that one day, maybe five or ten or twenty years from now, I'll be sitting home, watching TV, flipping through the channels. And as I'm flipping through the channels, I see an interview with a successful person, an influential person, a person who made a positive change in their self and in the community around them. Hopefully this person is one of you. And they will ask that person, so uh, how does you start? How did it all begin? And I want to hear that person say, well, years and years ago, I listened to a guy. His name is Muhammad something. And he changed it. My fellow audience, I want to leave you with a departing thought. In 2018, I went to Abha, because that's where I was born and raised. I went to Abha to see my parents. And one day I was at a gas station, and I'm filling my car with gas. And I look over, and I see an old man. I looked closer. I recognized the old man. It was the teacher who slapped my face and said, There is no hope out of you. <laughs> but then I said to myself, you know what, we make it. The past is the past. Let it go. So I walked to him, shook his hand, kissed him in the head. And he said, Do you remember me? He said, Yes, I know you. I used to teach you in school, and I'm so proud of you. You've seen what you've done. Yeah, of course you know. <laughs> and then I said, That's what I do with the Kawai Sam. I forgive you. And he said, For what? He said, you remember in first grade you, you slapped my face and he said there is no hope out of me. And he said, son, I don't remember. The year after, I was speaking in Jindal. And after my speech, I stood down and people came to me, shaking my hands, whatever, and I looked through the crowd. And I saw a person. I looked closer. I recognized him. The student who told me to stand in front of the crowd and speak. I went to him. I shook his hand. I kissed him on the head. And I said, I really wanted to thank you. And he said, For what? He said, You remember in high school you told me to stand in front of the audience and speak? And he said, I don't remember. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes to you, they might just be words. Something that you say. But you never know what impact it has on the person. The one thing that you say it might be the one thing that another person out there has been waiting to hear their entire life. Or you might say the wrong thing and you might devastatingly destroy someone's life. And for you, they will just it. Remember, my fellow audience, one day, we all are going to die. One day you will leave this earth. Ask yourself, did you leave it a better place just because you were in it? And then the answer is no, then what are you doing? When that day comes and you leave this earth, there might be three types of responses. People might say, Alhamdulillah, I'm not. Thank God he's gone. Or they might say, huh, okay. Or they might say, which response are you going to get? The choice is 
students. Thank you so much.